Droids are and always have been an incredibly important part of Star Wars. They're almost universally present in any given story, even those set before the Republic in some manner. In a recent video, we discussed the issue of droid sentience and shed some light on how droids work. Today, we'll be taking that a step further, discussing the types and productions of droids and those who produce them, as well as how that technology came into its modern form in detail. This video is proudly sponsored by Filmora 9. Now, this is a software I've actually been using for quite a while, and in fact, this ad is being edited on Filmora software right now. Now, I know a lot of you guys have YouTube aspirations as well, and what better place to start than Filmora? It was one of the first editing softwares I ever used after iMovie, and I can swear by it. The new Filmora 9 goes beyond the basics. You can now craft worlds by layering clips and using simple green screen effects. You can perfect your sound with things like keyframing and background noise removal and much more. So if you're looking for an affordable all-in-one editing software, then Filmora 9 is the program for you. So make sure you check out all their links in the description below for a solid yet simple editing experience that I can guarantee will help take your videos to the next level. Droids, as we discussed in the last video, are robots that possess both an independent capacity for movement and an artificial intelligence that is, on some level, self-aware. In any given era of the Star Wars galaxy, droids were the foundation of society. They performed innumerable basic jobs to allow organics to live better lives. And by the time of the Clone Wars, droids had become so deeply ingrained that few beings could even imagine life without them. Droids, it should be said, were nonetheless widely mistreated by the galaxy's organic inhabitants. Despite being self-aware, nearly all droids were the property of organic masters, and on many worlds, it was illegal for droid owners to release their droids from service. Other worlds mandate regular memory wipes, destroying any personalities that droids develop, and most encouraged the use of restraining bolts, which allowed droid owners to force their droids to shut down or even wipe their own memory. This sort of treatment was codified 4,000 years before the Clone Wars, right after the Great Droid Revolution, as part of the droid statutes, which primarily served to regulate crimes carried out by droids. So, how did this all start? Droid technology predated the invention of interstellar travel in the core world, with the oldest human-made droid models predating the Republic by about 5,000 years. Older alien civilizations like the Gri and the Rakatsa had droids even earlier. Indeed, as the core worlds were under the control of the Infinite Empire at the time, it's possible that modern droids were descended from Rakatsan technology, something that's also true of blaster weaponry, the hyperdrive, and many, many other pieces of advanced equipment that are nearly ubiquitous in the Star Wars galaxy. With the creation and the rise of the Galactic Republic, droid technology continued to advance. While the first droids were built for labor purposes, warlords quickly figured out that they could be turned into soldiers as well. As the Republic advanced, droids designed for science, mechanical work, and social interaction developed as well. And as droids developed, hatred for droids also developed. Those beings whose jobs had been given over to droids were often resentful of all droids for it. And such, anti-droid zealotry led to many establishments refusing to serve or allow entry to droids, a practice that faded and returned repeatedly over the course of galactic history. In 4015 BBY, public opinion largely turned against droids after the Great Droid Revolution, in which HK-01 led droids across the galaxy in a violent uprising against their meat bag oppressors. The widespread use of droids by the Kroth and Mandalorians in the Great Sith War, together with the rebellions of G0-T0 infrastructure droids in the years that followed, only served to harden public opinion for generations to come. Modern droid laws came into being shortly after these incidents, and they were further tightened after the Clone Wars, which sparked another wave of droid unpopularity. Nonetheless, by the time of the Republic Golden Age, fear of droids had diminished greatly, allowing for many great strides in droid technology between the new Sith Wars and the Clone Wars, especially for protocol-style droids and industrial models. Of course, this included battle droids too, especially toward the end of the age. The makers of the CIS droid army, restricted by cost though they were, made a great many advancements that streamlined the droid manufacturing process, and designed several very advanced models to serve in elite roles. Droids, by and large, were divided into five distinct classes. Class 1 droids were scientific models, which means that they filled roles ranging from medical positions to object analysis. 
Class 2 droids served in engineering or technical roles like astromechs, engineering droids, or advanced repair droids. Class 3s were designed for interaction with organics, including protocol models, servants, and tutors. Class 4 droids were combat droids, which included security droids, assassin droids, and of course, battle droids. Class 5s were labor droids, and made up a majority of the droid population of the galaxy. Droid manufacturing, by the time of the Clone Wars, was a very streamlined process. Manufacturers often worked from the inside out, designing and constructing the droid's basic chassis first. This was usually followed by the addition of traitware, which is to say parts of the droid that would be essential to its core functions, and then by the implementation of skillware, equipment required for secondary functions. Droid brains are installed next, and external plating tended to come last. The behavioral circuitry matrix, or the droid brain, is the most complicated part of any given droid, and indeed, it's what makes a droid a droid. Typically, they have two main components, the sensory response module, which included audiovisual circuits, olfactory and speech centers, spectrum analysis equipment, extremity control systems, and a gyro balance unit, served to provide droids with a means of perceiving, analyzing, and responding to sensory input. On the other hand, the obedience rationale module, which included motivators, memory banks, and a cognitive theory unit, established a droid's personality and behavioral functions. Programming droids, as you'd expect, was exceptionally complicated, and Clone Wars era droid programming techniques built upon thousands of years of small advancements in the field. Simply programming a droid to be able to move at a decent pace is a challenge, especially if the droid has legs, and programs for other essential movements are also much more complicated than one would think, as the programmer has to take balance and many other factors into account. But even more complex than the programs that allowed droids to operate were the programs that govern the functionality of droids. Creating self-awareness, after all, is no joke. For simple Class 5 droids, which were the first droid models invented, programming is comparatively simple. Most droids simply require enough cognitive programming to understand how to perform a task repeatedly, as well as the bare minimum elements of personality and cognitive independence to do so on a level of efficiency comparable to organic workers. By the time of the Clone Wars, the programming of Class 5s was fast and easy, as there had been a millennia of development for basic movement and personality codes. Programmers for new models simply needed to modify what they already had in a few places, and their work was complete. Class 4 droids, which were developed shortly after Class 5s, were a bit more complicated. All droids had to be programmed to react to changes in their environment to be effective, but for Class 4s, this reaction needed to be streamlined. Effective combat programming took thousands of years to develop, involving lots of trial and error. That said, by the time of the Clone Wars, programming new combat droids was nonetheless often very simple. By that point in time, effective combat programs had been in existence for a long time, and all that was necessary was to modify them to fit new chasers types. More advanced Class 4s, especially assassin droids, were far more difficult, and programmers often brought in experienced assassins or commandos to help them develop effective programming for high-end Class 4s. Class 1s and 2s were more complicated in another manner. Both needed to be extremely precise. For basic labor models and combat droids, extreme precision wasn't necessarily a concern. For medical droids and engineer models, however, it absolutely was. Extreme precision required improvement on both basic movement code and on behavioral programming, but once these improvements were made, they became all but universal, as such specifications were fairly easy to adapt to new models as well. Class 1 programmers faced the additional challenge of having to program droids with the capability for incredibly detailed analysis, while the developers of Class 2, especially astromechs and engineer droids, had to make the programming guidelines for their products extremely adaptable due to the unpredictability of intensive repair work. Class 3s were by far the most complicated droids to program, as their artificial intelligence needed to be on a human or near-human level in order to perform their jobs properly. For this reason, Class 3 droids came into being long after any other droid class, and even by the time of the Clone Wars, the programming of protocol models was considered to be a developing field. Programmers had to account for a myriad of social conventions, linguistic complexities, and thousands of other tiny variables that go into communication between organics, so that their products could fully understand and replicate them. 
Droid manufacturing was a highly profitable industry of course, and by the time of the Clone Wars it had cemented a major place in galactic society. There were millions of droid foundries in the galaxy by that point in time, including large numbers of mech worlds, planets that were all but completely covered in industrial factories. The two most important mech worlds were Mechas 3 and Telti, which rented out their facilities to droid making companies in exchange for large cuts of the profits. Other droid makers, especially those that were part of the techno union, cut out the middlemen and developed their own mech worlds, which had the same benefits without any of the fees involved. Oftentimes, these worlds were located deep in the outer rim, far from the prying eyes of inspectors and were otherwise uninhabited. There were hundreds of major droid manufacturers by the time of the Clone Wars, but the largest and most well-known were Industrial Automaton and Cybot Galactica. The two companies practically owned Telti between them and dominated multiple markets, with Industrial Automaton all but completely controlling the astromech droid industry and Cybot Galactica constantly beating out competitors with its protocol droids. By the start of the Separatist crisis, most droid manufacturers, as well as most companies in many other industrial fields, were affiliated with the Techno Union, a conglomerate of industrial corporations that, infamously, was responsible for the CIS droid army. The Techno Union was dissolved by the Empire after the Clone Wars ended for obvious reasons, as were many of its component companies, most notably Bactoid Combat Automata, a Genotion-run company that was responsible for the Confederacy's B-series droids. So that's an even deeper look into droids, how they worked and how they were made. But what do you think? Are there other types of Star Wars tech that you'd like to see us explore like this? Feel free to post your thoughts in the comments section below. And just before you go guys, as per usual, there's a whole bunch of needy links in the description below waiting for your clicks. So make sure you check them all out to join our Geetsleys Gaming Network, our main Geetsleys Discord where you can interact with other Star Wars fans, the Patreon if you want to support the channel more than you already are by watching this video, and our second history channel where you can learn heaps about the niche and unknown topics of World War II. Anyways guys, as always, thank you so much for watching and I hope to see you in the next video.